In this video, we're going to discuss one of the most important topics or two terminal device, which is MOS cap. And the entire discussion is divided into multiple segments to make sure we understand it in a very systematic way. So first, we're going to go and see the introduction of MOS cap, why we have to study MOS cap, and then find the necessary concepts to make sure we get the energy band diagram proper for MOS cap. And then we will understand what is ideal MOS cap and its modes of operations, which are namely accumulation, depletion, and inversion. And then we will understand what is threshold voltage definition and its equation. And at the same time, we'll see what is inversion charge, which is charge per unit area and its equation. And then we will understand what is CV characteristics, which is capacitance voltage characteristics. And of course, the name itself indicates it's a MOS capacitor. Hence, we have to understand the capacitance characteristics of the MOS cap. By then, we would have covered the ideal MOS thoroughly. And then we will introduce the non-idealities and then find out what happens to the threshold voltage. And of course, we will add flat band voltage as we go on C. And then we will see what will happen to the CV characteristics because of the non-idealities. Before we proceed, I have two suggestions. Number one, for the first timers who are trying to understand MOSCAP for the first time or trying to learn MOSCAP for the first time, where don't rush or hop or jump through topics. Please go through the uh, sequence mentioned here so that you understand it in a systematic way. And second suggestion is to anyone who is watching this is when you try to understand a topic, especially which is related to physics, the notations are very important. So if you're following different textbooks where the notations are different, I would suggest you to stick to one particular reference. Let's say if you're uh, taking these videos as reference, I would suggest you please stick to the notations. Once you have the notations, once you're clear with the concepts, Notations really doesn't matter, okay? But to understand the concepts initially, the notations really matter so that there are no confusions across. Before we go deep dive into understanding MOSCAP, the most important question is why study MOSCAP? Probably you have your own reasons of studying MOSCAP for the course or for a competitive exam. But coming to the actual concept, the most used semiconductor device in industry is MOSFET, which is used for digital and analog circuit design. Now, if you look at MOSFET, so I'm going to take the structure of MOSFET here, even though we haven't discussed MOSFET yet, but I'm going to take MOSFET for a minute or two to make you understand why study MOSCAP. This is gate terminal. And this material here is metal. And this material in the middle is oxide. And this material here is semiconductor. And we have this source region, which is N plus, and we have drain region, which is N plus. And this terminal is the gate terminal. This is bulk or body terminal. Now, if you look at the structure, Assuming that gate is grounded and we have source and drain potential difference applied here, there wouldn't be current flowing between drain and source because there is a depletion region here, there is a depletion region here, hence there are barriers, potential barriers, hence current doesn't flow between them. But in case, if we apply enough positive potential at gate, so let me take that example here. If you apply enough positive potential, there would be positive charges coming onto the gate, positive charges coming onto the gate. As this is oxide, which is insulator, we would get negative charges here. Let's say negative charges here, which is nothing but this region has become n type now because we have electrons as majority carriers, that's why we have negative charge here. Hence, this region forms a channel between source and drain, due to which if now we apply a potential difference across drain and source, current would flow through it. 
So it means we can control the current flowing between drain and source just by controlling the potential at the gate with respect to body or source. Now which means due to this the MOSFET can be made into an off on switch and the major operation which does this is because of the gate which is metal oxide and semiconductor operation. Now to understand MOSFET operation better we need to understand how this structure works which is metal oxide and semiconductor. Hence I am going to take this structure which is most important now to understand the operation and working of MOSFET. If I take this structure and draw it here now this would become a two terminal device where this is gate terminal and this is body or bulk terminal. This is metal, this is insulator and this is semiconductor. So if you put across, in fact historical reasons this has been metal which was aluminum used but nowadays it is in fact a polysilicon that is used as a gate. And if you look at this insulator, the insulator that is used is silicon dioxide. SiO2 which we call this as oxide and semiconductor which is used is silicon. Now if you look at this we have metal oxide semiconductor which is MOS metal oxide semiconductor which we call MOS and we call this M OS diode because this is a two terminal device. We have gate and body terminals. So this is called MOS diode and in fact it is also called as MOS cap because we know why it is MOS. We have seen here metal oxide semiconductor cap because the oxide which is insulator is sandwiched between a conductor and a semiconductor which would act as a capacitor. We would see its capacitance characteristics in detail in future videos or in the future sections. So this is called MOS cap. Now if you look at this in terms of electrical properties we have conductor which is in fact the metal and we have a insulator which is the silicon dioxide and we have a semiconductor which is silicon this is semiconductor. In terms of electrical properties we have all three kinds of materials and in terms of atomic arrangement periodicity if you look at this polysilicon is polycrystalline polycrystalline and silicon dioxide is amorphous and semiconductor is crystal. If you look at this in terms of electrical properties we have all three kinds of materials here and in terms of atomic arrangement we have all three categories of materials here. Now the next thing is to understand how to draw the energy band diagram of a metal oxide semiconductor diode which is MOS diode. Let me turn to next page. This kind of orientation will be used throughout the course because uh, this is how we are going to uh, put the charge distributions, uh, electric fields, potentials and even the energy band diagrams. So to start with how do we find the energy band diagram for this metal oxide semiconductor or MOS cap. First of all we have to find the uh, uh, energy band diagram for the metal. So for metal it is very simple and straightforward because uh, we need to represent only the Fermi energy level which is EF because in metals below Fermi energy level all the energy levels would be literally filled with plenty of electrons and above EF there will be plenty of vacant states. This is the reason due to which when you apply a potential difference across a metal there will be very little resistance to electric current conduction. Now for the oxide, oxide is an insulator which means the energy band diagram if you take EC and EV the difference would be very high because it's an insulator. 
the energy gap EC to EV would be very high as it is an insulator. Now, but the real question is if you want to actually combine this and make the entire energy band diagram before we find for semiconductor, we wouldn't know where is EF with respect to EC because these are two different materials. For example, if you go back and think about the PN junction that we discussed, P side material, if it is silicon, N side material is also silicon, dope with different materials by the way, but still both are silicon. We know EC of both of them would be at the same level to start with and once they acquire equilibrium, they will be different. But we know where to start with, but in this case we don't know. So in order for that reason, what we're going to do is we need to find a common energy between both of them so we can align this EF with respect to EC. So where do we find that? There is a concept called vacuum energy level where if you have a material and if there are electrons inside them, if you have to give some energy where this electron can come out of the material itself, where the electron no more belongs to the material. That electron which came barely out of the material is at vacuum energy level. Now let's say if that electron is out of the metal, and if the same electron, let's say you get it out of the oxide, both the electrons would be at the vacuum energy level, which is same. So that can be taken as a reference so that we can draw the energy band diagrams. But there are concepts which talk about the difference between the vacuum energy level to that of EF, which is given by Q times phi m for metal, which is called the work function. So the difference, this is let's say the E0 energy, which is vacuum energy level. This difference E0 to the EF is called Q phi M, M for metal. This is called the work function of metal. This is nothing but the difference between E0 to EF. Now, but in case of insulator, we haven't drawn a Fermi energy level because there are no free electrons that we want to account because there are none. Hence, there is no current connection we are interested in. So there is no average energy that we are interested in, which is nothing but Fermi energy level. So we wouldn't be drawing a Fermi energy level for an oxide. In that case, what is the work function, right? So in that case, we have another definition called the electron affinity, which is given by Q times chi. This is called the electron affinity. Now, in this case, we have electron affinity, which is defined as the vacuum energy level minus the bottom edge of the conduction band, which is given by Q times chi. So, I'm going to write here Q times chi of oxide to indicate it is of oxide. This is called electron affinity. Now there are two things that we have discussed. One is work function, which is nothing but the energy difference between the vacuum energy level to that of the Fermi energy level. And we have discussed electron affinity, which is given by Q times chi, which is nothing but vacuum energy level minus the bottom edge of the conduction band. Now we know the energy band diagrams for metal and oxide. Now we need to see for the semiconductor. Semiconductor is the most uh, discussed one throughout this course. So let's see, let's say we have uh, EC here. This is in fact E0 vacuum energy level, this is E0. And let's say the band gap is of this much, which is EB. And the midpoint of the energy band gap is EI, intensive Fermi energy level. And then we have Fermi energy level here, EF. The Fermi energy level is closer to EV because we took it as a p-type substrate. Now, the difference between E0 to EC is called as Q chi S, S indicating the semiconductor. This is the electron affinity of semiconductor. And the difference between this E0 and EF is Q times phi S which is the work function of the semiconductor. So let me put this here. This is for metal. This is for oxide and this is for semiconductor. In this case, this is silicon. Now we have all the energy band 
diagrams for metal oxide and semiconductor it's all about combining them taking e naught as reference so that we know what is the distance between ec to ef and this ec to this ac so that's why the vacuum energy level is taken as a reference and we got two concepts to understand one is work function another one is electron affinity i can write q phi s is equal to q chi s plus ec to ei which is nothing but eg over 2 which is half of the energy band gap plus ei minus ef which is nothing but kt ln of na over ni so this is basically the work function of semiconductor which is dependent on the doping concentration of the semiconductor